the differences, the psychological, physical, temperamental differences between men and women. I explained that issue in a lot of detail. Number two, gender roles are mixed up. I explained that as well in detail, that uh, Islamically the role of a man based on his gender is different to the role of a woman based on her gender. Just to clarify, it doesn't mean what I said yesterday, it does not mean somebody was asking that women shouldn't be working or can't work. No, Islam doesn't say that. It is halal and permissible and sometimes required and needed as well. But the only point I was making is that a woman should not be forced to work or made f to feel bad for working, especially from her husband, that uh, you need to also work. Um, a husband should never expect his wife to work. If she says, you know what, I just want to relax all day long, just stay at home. I don't want to work at all. That's perfectly her right and actually in spirit of Islam. So, but if she wants to, she can do so as well. So there's nothing haram in it, especially in this day and age, like times have changed a bit, so sometimes we do require, uh, and in many areas we need Muslim women, uh, Muslim sisters need a Muslim female medic, doctor, etc, etc. So you will need Muslim women. But the point is that, what I just said, that's one thing, that uh, they shouldn't be forced or expected or made to feel bad to work. And number two, they should not give preference to a lifetime of career over family. That's, that's a really important part. The same goes with men as well, but because men are regarded as the breadwinners, that's their responsibility, they have to work Islamically. Otherwise they're sinful. الرِّجَالُ قَوَامُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا So if men don't work, they're sinful. But women aren't, so therefore, what Islam is saying that this, this attitude of like giving preference to career, like I just want, and the, the, we find that in this day and age there are some, some women, uh, some non-Muslim women, mostly, they don't marry, they don't have children, nothing, because they just want a career. People live that lifestyle. They don't marry, and it's okay for them not to marry because they can fulfill their needs outside of marriage. There's lots of non-Muslim women across the Western world. They, they don't marry. They are really busy, six in the morning, out of the home. Directors of big firms and companies and businesses. 10,000 people working under them and majority of them are men. And they, they have a very high pressurized job. But they have needs as well. So how do they fulfill their needs? In whatever way you can imagine. Many of them don't even go into relationships. Many women and some men as well. They say this, we can't do people live. This is the pressure of the society has stopped people from getting into relationships. I'm not even talking about marriage. Non-Muslims I'm talking about. Muslims can only do marriage. Non-Muslims, they did marriages and they did relationships. Now we're living in a time that people are no longer even want to do relationships. I don't know if you guys know all this. I know a lot of things. You must be thinking. A lot of research on this area. There's a lot of people who don't actually do relationships anymore. No time for relationship. But there's still emotional, sexual needs. So, it's like... Whenever you get hungry, you have a bit of food, Tim Hortons. So they fulfill their needs in that way. As and when needed. The whole family system is destroyed because of that. The whole family setup is destroyed. Islam came, one of the main maqasid of Islam was Hifdun Nasr. Family, lineage, progeny, building a home. So if you are going to do that, then there has to be a balance. Yes, if somebody doesn't want to uphold family values, then fine. 
Nobody needs to be a breadwinner, and nobody needs to work, uh, be at home, nobody needs to bring up the children, and nobody needs to look after kids, and nobody, you know, you don't need relationships, you don't need marriages, that's it. But if we say that, no, we want to uphold family values, and we want families, then there has to be a balance. A family cannot run with everybody outside. Some families, they don't see each other except on the weekends. I mean, last year, we had this course here, on upbringing of children, I talked about all of this. That I don't know if some people attended that. That children need their parents. Some parents don't see their children except on weekends. How is that possible? One meal, like last year I said, at least one meal a day the whole family should be eating together. At least one meal. Father, mother, brother, sister, at least one meal. As a family. There's so much barakah, so much blessings. And I'm talking about even fathers. Okay, Allah has given responsibility for the husband, for the father, for the man to work. But that, that doesn't mean he works as a crazy maniac. What benefit is in working when you can't even see your family? They don't want just your money. They want your time. They want your support. They want your love. They want your companionship, your children. People sometimes they work so hard and they don't like what's the point in working so hard that stops you from in, enjoying quality family time? Because what happens? Work itself becomes a maqsad. Money, wealth itself becomes an objective. The objective was to earn, the money was wealth, job, money was a means to an objective which is have a bit of. Tranquil life. But what happens? Work, job, money, wealth becomes objective. And when that becomes objective, then we've misunderstood the point basically. So, anyway, uh, without going into too much detail, I talked about all of this. Gender roles are mixed up. So, the summary of that was basically that Islam wants a balanced family. And because in order to run a family properly, you need someone managing the household affairs and someone managing the outside affairs. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made this taqseem between Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and um, Fatima Zahra radiallahu anha. It has to, you can't have both at home or you can't have both. It's just logical. You can't have both husband and wife and we're both not working. We'll just both be at home. And or both of them go outside. You might say, why are you not both at outside and both at home? That is possible, but based on the physical, emotional, and, and you know the strengths and weaknesses of each gender, one has to take more control of one aspect. So that's why we say both husband and wife can go outside and work as well, and both should do the household things as well. The man as well, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to help in the household. That's so much a man should do at home. But there has to be one person in charge of domestic issues and one person who is responsible, in charge meaning responsible. So the man is responsible for earning the money, even though he helps at home. The woman, even though she works outside, but she's responsible. You know, you must have seen some like gadgets and stuff. The, the queen of the kitchen, you know, the, the, the woman's rule at home. Don't, don't like interfere what kind of paint and what kind of, what, what you need in the house. That's it, that's, that's all of, she's the boss. She says this light goes there, it goes there, it doesn't go there. That's how it should be. Say, look, Dio, this, this, this is your domain. You're in charge. Anyway, so sometimes because these gender roles get mixed up, we start having problems in marriages. And um, I wrote here as well where feminism is rife, divorce rates are on the increase. I explained this yesterday as well in quite detail. Point three. From the factors that cause breakdown of marriages. People entering marriages with too much high expectations. Sadly, this is fueled by the internet and watching too many soap operas and I just as an example I put Bollywood movies. Another reason why marriages have 
problems and face and experience problems is because we have too many expectations in marriages. Too many expectations. Expectations from who? From everyone involved. Expectation from the man entering the marriage, expectation from the woman entering the marriage, expectation from both families. There's too many expectations. And because of these expectations, high expectations, people enter marriages when they, before they got married, they were thinking of all sorts of things that my marriage will be like this and it will be like that and you know this will, I will get a mansion here and after two years I'll be moving into this six bedroom property and then we'll have two beautiful children here, you know, and it's like all, like a, some Hollywood, Bollywood, some kind of uh, setup. That's why I said it, this is fueled by internet, meaning Sometimes we see so-called celebrities, dunya celebrities, um, we think, oh, look at their marriage. And seriously, there's no one's, you know, the, if you really knew the private lives of these people, probably your marriages are 10,000 times better than those people who pose for the cameras thinking they want love and lovey-dovey people. Each celebrity goes through five, six different divorces in their life. And each time they say, this is the one, and you know, ah, oh, they're engaged, and it's come, and you know, okay, it looks like they're dating now, and it looks like, yeah, yeah, and they, there's so much love going on, and this and that, and then the date has been announced, and the whole world goes crazy, yes, they're getting married. And then after that, things are, you know, they get married, and everyone gets so excited, and everything, and then after a few months, and maybe they've had a kid or two, and then after two, three years, it looks like there's some differences and some problems occurring and something, and, and divorce. Chapter two, next person. After a while, looks like now she's dating, she's gone back onto the dating scene. And someone else, marriage, divorce. Chapter three, chapter four. There was this woman called Liz Taylor. I don't know if you've heard of her. Some celebrity old. She went, she was, I don't know if she, what, she, what industry she was in, but she went through like nine, ten different divorces and marriages. It's all these celebrities. And these are just marriages. Remember, they don't just do nikah and marriage. These are eight, nine divorces. But then after that, there's also relationships. Before they get to the marriage stage, they've already had about 20. Different dating from the age of nine. So, when people look at all of this online, they think, oh, this is how a relation should be. This is how marriages should be. This is how the prince and princess should be. And then not just celebrities looking at just general people on social media. I think I mentioned this yesterday as well. Don't ever get affected by anyone else's life. That's the worst thing anyone can do. And those people who are married, etc., don't, don't post your pictures. Why do you have to post pictures of where you and your wife are eating in a brilliant restaurant? Why, why, why? I still, till today, I don't get this. Why somebody would do that? I'm not saying it's haram, but I'm just saying, personally, I just don't get it. Personally, I would not even put my children's pictures online. It's permissible, but I'm just saying, well, I don't know, if young children, they're not balik, they, you haven't taken their permission. You know, as soon as a baby comes into the world, a selfie. As soon, as soon before adhan and iqama, they are on Facebook. I let them come into the world, live a few years, make them make a decision, do you want to be online or not? Once the pictures are out, that's it, they're out. Anyone can do it. You know these pictures, we think it's just gone on our Facebook page or Twitter page or what's that thing called? Instagram and whatever. Is it? Snapchat. We think it's just there. You know, people can do all sorts with your pictures. People can do all sorts. 
People can use pictures of, I read an article on this, that there's pedophiles who use pictures of children of just normal people and send it to people. People pose that this is my child and this is... There's women, when they post their pictures, people make f fake accounts, um, uh, fake account, acting as... Uh, uh, what's the word? Pre not acting as, presenting himself as... Well. Mm, no, that's a word. Simple word. Impersonating is a simple word. Posing, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes his words don't come. I think the coffee needs a bit more. Like, this is not even coffee. They, they pose themselves. There, there'll be a man who'll make a fake account posing himself as a woman and he'll be using a woman's pictures that he's seen all over the Facebook. And say that's put a different name. They do these kind of things. It's a crazy world out there. The less pictures you have online, the better. So when you're married, there's no need to put all your wedding pictures and this picture. Just, okay, if you want to just uh, share them with a few family members, friends, relatives, just send them on WhatsApp or something like that. That's okay, but like, putting it out where... You want everyone's likes, wow, mashallah, mashallah, amazing sister, amazing brother, amazing sister. You know, it just... Again, we have become attention-seeking crazy maniacs. That's what this is, attention-seeking. There's so many people don't get attention in real life, so what they do is they imagine a life. And that's what pictures do, filters, you know what filters are? So basically, because nobody is giving you attention in real life, so you think, this is how I would like to look. And then you put all the filters, and then put a picture, and then say, whoa, you are beautiful, you are beautiful. Especially for sisters, you're beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. And you're getting that dopamine crazy buzz. Beautiful, beautiful. Because in the world, nobody's telling you I'm beautiful. Nobody needs to tell you that in person. And all these people telling you beautiful online, it's easy, just behind the screen, you're beautiful, it's easy. Nobody, you're not beautiful because people tells you, tell you you're beautiful and you don't become ugly because anyone tells you you're ugly. Beauty and ugliness is nothing to do with what people say. It's how you feel. It's how you yourself in your heart feel. There's no definition. There's no definition of beauty. It's relative. Someone finds green beautiful, somebody finds blue beautiful. Somebody finds yellow beautiful, somebody finds purple beautiful. Somebody finds tall beautiful, somebody finds short beautiful. Somebody finds skinny beautiful, somebody finds a bit larger beautiful. It's all relative. It's not what people think. Society makes you think that this is what beauty is. That's not beauty. This is crazy society. How you are in yourself. This is, I know I've gone off topic slightly, okay, I need to get back. This is, these are all other separate topics that I've also talked about because this is, you know, people need to understand this, this whole system that's been created around us. All of this is making people depressed. All of this is making people depressed. Anxiety, stress, you need to look in a certain way, you need to act in a certain way. There's no need. Forget everybody, forget the makhluk. Beauty is how you are as a person. Feel confident, feel good about yourself. Have a connection with Allah. Beauty is in the akhlaq and character. How you are as a gentle person and human being. That makes you beautiful. And I'm talking about men and women. So anyway, people enter marriages with too many high expectations. And this is fueled by internet. Because so now people are looking at other people's marriages online. Oh, so this is how you should be. And then they think, we don't get that in our life. So then they have problems. And also watching too many of these soap operas and Bollywood movies and Hollywood, spe uh, Bollywood especially. That's all fake, it's all camera. So they think, you know, when I get married, I'm going to be, you know, like I'll get my husband will be like Salman Khan and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, and he'll pick me up and, you know, we'll have some romantic times and this is how romance is. That's not real life, that's just a camera. Cut, finish. That's those same people, if they were that great, they would never have any divorces in their life. They have the most divorces. Many of them are also involved in drug abuse. Do you know most of the celebrities are the, are the most depressed? It's hidden sometimes, and sometimes it comes out in the open. 
they have the most money, the most limelight, the most fan base, but they become the most depressed. Depression in Hollywood, there is so much depression in Hollywood. So much depression. That so many of these actors are on depression and depression pills, anxiety pills. Despite having millions of pounds, millions and billions don't, doesn't make you happy. Properties and fame doesn't make you happy. Happiness is a ni'mah that Allah grants into the heart. Surur fi qalbi muslim. And that comes in a different way. Happiness is something else. You could have less and you could be so content and happy. And you could have millions and you could be completely depressed in the mind. So, therefore, have less expectations. Both brothers and sisters. Brothers, when you get married, then before marriage and even in your marriage, expect less from your wife. Don't expect she's going to cook biryani every day. I don't keep saying biryani. That's not my favorite food. It's just something that's come to my mouth. But um, don't keep on expecting she'll do this and she'll do that and she'll do this and she has to look in this way. and she has. Some of the expectations from the men are so extreme and crazy. Honestly, what can I say? There's just so many things. There's no time. This, this one point... The expectation from the man that his wife has to look in a particular way and has to f like to be absolutely explicit, maintain a figure, that's ridiculous. Because what happens, this, this is not, a man and a woman's connection is spiritual. When you are spiritually connected, you're going to grow old, you're going to be 55, your wife's going to have wrinkles, then what? You're going to say, okay, that's why people who are not physically, uh, who are not spiritually connected, and it's all about lust, then the moment she has some wrinkles and given birth to some children and some stretch marks, that's it, you want to go for another 21-year-old. That's what they do. The connection, I'm being open and frank here, the connection has to be spiritual, spiritual one. Likewise, sometimes expectations for women. My husband has to look in a certain way or has to be in a certain way or he has to earn a certain amount, has to be like X, Y, Z. Don't expect too much from marriages. If Allah has given you a spouse, as long as he's not, you know, he's just simple, he's a nice human being, he's earning a bit of money and you're eating, you're breathing, you're living, alhamdulillah, Toronto, such a beautiful city, you go outside, you can have Tim Hortons. You can, you can breathe there. What else do you want in life? Came out of the hotel today and just, Alhamdulillah, I was able to breathe. Such a great ni'mah. Thanked Allah a hundred times that I was able to breathe today. Just take the, you know, two, we, we could die. I could have woken up in the morning and not come here. That's why I read the dua. Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana. All thanks to Allah who gave me life after I died in a night in my hotel. I was dead. Last night I was dead. That's the, that's the eye of the Quran. Allah says, Allah takes away your souls when you sleep. Those who die, Allah takes their souls. And those who have not died in their sleep, Allah takes away their souls. فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ the ones Allah has decided that that's it. No more in the world. He keeps hold of the souls. So anyway, just try to make life easy generally, like I was saying yesterday. Number four, quickly moving on. Uh, immature attitudes. This also, this is more like a male problem. Until now, all of them were like men, men and women. So expectations from both sides. Immature attitude is sometimes men have a very immature attitude despite being married and want to still live a bachelor lifestyle. This can cause problems. This is very common. I've seen this a lot, a lot, especially in the beginning of marriages. Uh, there's so many, so many cases that I've dealt with when because they get married, they're 24, 25, and they're still thinking like they're bachelors, they're living a bachelor lifestyle. They just think, you know, going with the maids. You know, you know, within the brothers, there's this joke, I don't know if the sisters know, but they always tease one another. You know what the teasing is? 
When you get married, uh, that's it, you're not going to see you, that's it, this guy, he's got married. Be proud, I'm married, yes, you're not going to see me anymore. Of course not. Like, you see me less now, of course, I've got, I've got a family now. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. This is one brother I know in London, and I told him, I said, look, when your friends say this, all you say, yes, this is the sunnah, this is, this is the way Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa encouraged me, I've got a family now, so now I don't have time to spend with friends. Give time to your family. So sometimes, despite getting married, they, they become very immature. They still remain, sorry, they, they still remain immature. They still act as though they are bachelors. Maturity is a very good quality to have. For both men and women, but mature, maturity, there's beauty in maturity. And these, you know, going back to what I was saying, that you know this beauty is relative. You can't. Some people like blue, green. You know, these are things we can't control. How we look, no control. How our facial features are, we don't have control over that. What color we have, we don't have no control over that. Um, how tall and short we are, no control over that. Parents, my parents are very short. I'm short. When I'm with Sheikh Hublis, like when I'm standing next to him, it's like there, I'm here. This Mufti Abdul Rahman is a good friend of mine. We have programs a lot of times together. So like people, when they invite us, they call, they say, this is a short Mufti, tall Mufti. We don't have control about these type of things. But what do we have control over? And I was saying figure as well. We slightly have control over that, you know. So healthy, as, as long as you're eating healthy and then... You, Sometimes people eat healthy, they still have, you know, they, there's no control. So, but what we have control over in terms of beauty, then we should take care of that. Maturity is something that makes someone beautiful. That's something we have the control over. Being immature, irresponsible is not a good trait. Especially for men, but both, both men and women. But why is it especially for men? Because Islamically, as well as outside Islam, generally, uh, a woman is supposed to be mature, but in a relationship, without going into the depth of this, in a relationship, the woman is supposed to be a bit more immature than the man in, in the relationship. I don't know if you understood what I'm saying, but anyway. So, this is why, you know, to finish off this point, there's a big trend nowadays of I'm talking about outside the wider community there's a big trend of younger girls wanting to be in relationships with older men it's a big big trend I'm telling you things from Quran Sunnah and also what's going on you're probably thinking well, how does this guy know all of this it's a big trend, massive trend. They object when it comes to Aisha radiallahu anha and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam objection and others as well. In the earlier times, they make all the objections when it comes to religion. But right now, it is so common, especially in North America, it's so common, so common. The men are like in the 40s and 50s, and their wives or their girlfriends or whatever they want to call them, they're like in their early 20s. Very common, very extremely common. Young girls in their early mid 20s, they actually prefer older, older men. This is like absolutely common, it's becoming very common. One of the reasons is they like the maturity. That's what they say. I read a whole article on this, reasons for it. Anyway, so maturity is very important. Number five is another point, a breakdown of marriages. Immature, uh, actually, uh, no, we've done that, sorry. Outside interference. Outside interference from family members and friends can be detrimental to a marriage being prosperous. This is a really important reason. Marriages break down, divorce occur, divorces occur, separations happen, problems in marriage because of interference from others. 
When I say others, family members as well as friends and the wider community. People interfering in your marriage. Don't let others affect or influence your life. And this happens more sometimes for our sister's side. You'll have a marriage, it's not perfect. Like I said yesterday, there's some issues. Your friend's sister will come and talk to you for two hours and then that's it. When your husband comes, that's it. You, you, you've got a face on and this and that. Just because your, sister, your friend came and spoke to you about something. She's probably going through a breakdown of marriage and she wants your marriage to also break as well. So you have some company probably. <laughs> Who knows? Don't let anyone else influence you. You have aql, you have a brain, you have your own personality, understanding. You look at your own marriage. Don't let anyone interfere or influence your decision. Rather, there's a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I can't recall the actual Arabic words. Man khababa imra'atan. Anyone know? from those students and ala zawjiha yeah something like that check it out there's some students someone said there was a student here I don't know from the sister's side uh, whoever turns a wife against her husband and I can't recall, recall the uh, rest of the hadith there's some warnings it's, it's a sinful act so going and likewise not just for turning a wife against a husband, likewise the other way as well. Someone turns a husband against a wife. You have a male friend and saying, you know what, if, if I was married to her, I would have divorced her a long time ago. Like, what are you doing with her until now? How can you just keep her? Like, are you crazy? Like, she's doing all this to you. Rather, you should be a marriage maker, you know, family maker, not a marriage wrecker. There's too many marriage wreckers in this world. Just because their marriages are not working, so they want to wreck other people's marriages. Give good advice. Look, I said here after that, uh, others can give, and then I put this in, like highlighted, uh, others can give sincere advice. Sincere. From the heart. If someone asks you for advice, like for, first of all, no one asks you, then no button. But if someone asks you, say, look, you know, this is what the situation is. Try to save the marriage. Help them. Be sincere. Be, want for them what you want for yourself. But then you should let the couple deal with the issues themselves. This is when family and friends and relatives and people ask you advice. Even imams, I would say. I mean, this is my normal practice. I never, like, to the ultimate level, I think only on one or two occasions I've kind of said that, yeah, I think you should just finish this marriage off. Out of many cases, always say, well, you can try, you can work, it's possible. And then if you want to, I will never say, yeah, do you think we should go for a divorce? It's up to you, you decide. I'm not telling you. But no, but do you think that we should now just separate? I don't know, I don't live, I'm not you, I'm not her. I don't live in your house. I haven't lived together with you two for 10 years. You know yourself best. We can't make a decision. Sometimes some people think that Imams will make a decision. Imams are not there to make decisions for you. Scholars are not there to make decisions for you. Allah has given everybody aql. This is another problem in our community where the, local, the general public, when they come to the Imams, they act as though they have no aql. No brain. You see, every human being is intelligent. We respect the scholars, we listen to the scholars, we take our deen from them, we learn from them, but we've got aql as well. We don't become passive. Do you understand this point? Don't become passive. Allah has given everybody aql. We are people with aql, human beings. We've got qualities. We are all intelligent people. So therefore, sometimes you have to make your own decision. Take advice, go to a sheikh, and remember, only ask advice from people who you think is really sincere, people who you think are really sincere. Those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear the messenger, you know, have love for the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, act upon deen. People who you think are 
sincere, mature, understanding, balanced, have no personal agenda involved and see what they say and then decide. So other people should not interfere. Did you find that hadith somebody was checking? No? Did you not find it? Check online. Man khabbab imra'atan someone. I want, I want to know. I think this hadith is in Zaru Talibin, if I remember correctly. Number six is a very important point as well. Expectation from in-laws. Oh, big problem. Massive problem. And living together with them can cause marital conflict. It is best to live separately, especially in our times. This will go a long way in preserving the marriage. Okay. minna man khabbaba imra'atan ala zawjiha. The one who turns a wife against her husband is not from us. Warning from Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not from us. Laysa minna. Not from my community. Laysa minna man afsada imra'atan ala zawjiha. Same kind of meaning. Meaning, from us is not the one who corrupts a woman against her husband. Said, like makes her go against her husband, and in both ways, yeah. Look, both ways is actually hadith the other way. So, the one who makes a man to get, turn against his wife, there's a specific hadith for that as well. He, the Messenger of Allah mentioned both, and he mentioned some other things as well. Abdan ala Sayyidih. Someone who makes a worker turn against his boss. Just basically trying to corrupt relationships. You know, some people, they love doing that. That's their job. They take on the role and job of who? Whose role and job are they taking? Shaitan. Shaitan likes all of this. So Shaitan is basically, you know, just there's no time, but Shaitan, the word Shaitan from there, it's not only Iblis. Iblis is one Shaitan. Shaitan is not his name is not Shaitan. His name is Iblis. Shaitan means someone who turns you away from Allah, the one who's cursed. Shaitan Shaitan. So shaitan could be Iblis, Iblis is shaitan, but there could be many other shayateen, al-ins wal-jinn. That's why the Quran says shayateen al-ins wal-jinn. There's loads of shayateen. There's so many satans, human form and jinn form. So anyone who does this has become the jinn shaitan. So someone turns you away against your husband or your wife, just say, you're shaitan. That's what you are basically. That's what shaitan is, doesn't, that's not his name. So, anyway, uh, expectation from in-laws and living together. This is also a massive problem. A lot of expectations we find in our communities from in-laws, which can cause marriage problems. Sometimes the couples themselves are happily living in a very, very good relationship. But what happens? There's expectations from in-laws, and that really puts pressure, a lot of pressure, on the couple. And it brings problems in the marriages. Now, when we say in-laws, both sides, in-laws from the brother's side and from the sister's side, from the man's side, from the woman's, from the bride, from both sides. But generally in our communities, the expect, there's more so, so I would talk about both sides. If you look at the man's side, uh, no, we'll talk about that's, that's where the ma mainly the, the expectation and pressure and force is, but sometimes it's from the wife's side as well. It's less, but you have that, so let's talk about the less part first. So, for example, expectations, they keep on checking every week, like, is my daughter eating? Have you fed her? Is she having all her pizzas? And is she sleeping? And the mother's calling every other day. Oh, you know, what's he doing to you? Is he okay? Like, Let her live. She's gone. Finish. Don't keep on interfering. I was mentioning this 
the other day, on Friday when I had a talk in Osho, there's a hadith, a masjid, there's a hadith where there is a Sahabi, this is in Al-Bukhari and elsewhere, famous hadith, there's a Sahabi called Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He was newly married. He is a major companion. What's his name? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. His father was Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu. Both major companions, father and son, and even the mother, Umm Abdullah, she was a major companion, a, whole, a very noble family. So his father, he says himself, married me off to a woman from Quraysh, that Hasab, like a, from a very, very good background. The hadith is long, and I don't want to mention, I mentioned that hadith for another reason. But the point here is, after he married, his father married him off, this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. His father periodically used to check whether his son is treating his daughter-in-law well. He used to ask his daughter-in-law, Kaifa Abdullah? How is Abdullah? Is he treating you well? Is he fulfilling your rights? What is he doing? Asking who? The daughter-in-law is my son looking after you, not asking the son is my is your wife looking after you. This is what happens in our, our communities. So parents will worry more about their own son or daughter. They won't care about the other person. We'll actually we won't even fulfill the hukuk of justice because because this connection of parents. I know parents love their children, but this love should not be a reason, cause of just treatment. We have to work on this. Love becomes blind. And it happens from a young age. You know, you have young children, they're having a fight in the garden, you're five-year-old and the neighbor's five-year-old. Like, you know, just a small scratch, but why did the neighbor's child scratch, scratch? What about what he did or she did to them? You know, we always just stick up for our children. Even in madrasa, like our children, school, we always stick up and we spoil them like this. So anyway, um, this Abdullah ibn Amr used to ask every so often the daughter-in-law, how is it treating? So the point here I was saying, that from the woman's side, there should be no expectations, no interference. These, this point, uh, outside inter uh, interference and expectations, they're kind of connected, five and six. Just a general check, just check. She's still alive, yes, alhamdulillah, she's breathing, that's fine. Some mothers are like, you know, she wants to, don't keep on calling, you. call your moms, no problem. When you get married, talk to your mom, definitely. But don't tell uh, uh, all the details of what happens and how many you know, pieces of bread you ate and, and you know, how, how, what, what you did. Some girls, they talk about everything, even the bedroom department. How her husband was, was touching her in the bed, that's what they described to their mothers. Maybe he did this and he came at 11.07 in the bedroom and then he picked his phone up at 11.08 and then he went to the toilet, and then he wasn't smiling at me, and he wasn't doing this, and, mm, come on. Just. So this happens a lot, you know sometimes they just phone and talk about everything, talk to Allah, complain, make your complaints to Allah, have a conversation with Allah, like I was saying in the lecture yesterday. So, sometimes this in interference and expectations so expectations like, are you looking after my daughter? How much money are you giving my daughter? Are you providing for her? Are you taking on holidays? Like, what is this question? Did you take my daughter to the holiday? Like, she's married to me, I'll take her when I want to. If I don't want to take, we don't, I, I don't go holidays. Five years, it's nothing to do with you. Like, what's it to you? Like, if I take a holiday, it's my family. What kind of question is that? And have you taken my daughter to a holiday? This is their life, they know best, let them live, don't interfere. Now they are husband-wives, they are, they are one, you know, together as a couple, they're connected. 
They will decide when they want to go on holiday, they will decide. Yes, when there's abuse and it's apparent and it's clear. And then of course, then that's when you step in. Again, in a calm, composed manner, without becoming crazy. You're mature parents, you're in your 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever. So in a very calm way, try to diffuse the situation. And if, if it's divorce, then it's divorce. But that's when things are bad, not small, small things. So this interference sometimes occurs from the wife's family. And more so the interference, definitely more so, in our communities, interferences from whose side? The husband's side. That's the main problem. Expectations from the mother-in-law and the father-in-law. The, the wife's mother-in-law and father-in-law. Some communities, they think that the daughters married the mother-in-law, father-in-law more than the son. They get married to do khidmah. They, they, if they, they, Islamically, there is no responsibility, there is no requirement whatsoever. You are not doing anything haram or makru tahrim or makru tanzi or khilaf al-awla or nothing if you don't do anything for your father and mother in law. Not even this much. There's nothing wrong whatsoever in Islam if you didn't do anything. Which means nobody should make you feel bad, guilty, sad, depressed for not doing anything. Yes, if you did do something, you get a lot of reward. But that's your reward between you and Allah. You want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, that's up to you. Nobody makes you feel bad. Nobody should make you feel bad as a woman. A woman is not marrying, that's not her father and mother. Call their father and mother, mother-in-law, out of respect, no problem. But they don't become the rights of parents. Don't apply to her. They are the parents of a husband. He needs to fulfill the hukuk. And he should not force anything on his wife to do for his own parents. And I will tell you, and I've mentioned this many times before as well. Because we live in a society when there's expectations from in-laws. When there are expectations, whenever there's expectations, so for example, a mother-in-law expects that when the daughter-in-law comes into my house and when she marries my son, she has a lot of expectations. She must wake up early, she must cook the food, she must do this, she must clean the house, she must do all the stuff. So because she thinks that's her right, she deserves that right, she expects it, she demands it. When she expects it, then what happens? Any time on a, any particular day when she, the daughter-in-law, she is slightly neglectful or a bit, you know, not with it on that day or she's slackened off slightly, what happens? The mother-in-law will? She'll get what? Speak? Are you guys awake? Hello, brothers? Sisters, I think, are awake. How many fingers? Three. 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 So the mother-in-law will become what? I'm gonna have, need some answers. The mother-in-law will become what? Upset. upset. You can speak. So they can they can know that the sisters are speaking. They'll, she'll get upset and angry. Why? Because she was expecting it. Now let's take the reverse scenario. If the mother-in-law was a practicing mother-in-law. This is how you become in practice. And practicing is not just hijab and niqab. It's much more to that than that. She understands Islam from a hukuk al ibad point of view. She understands that this woman has married my son. I have no rights over her. So I'm not going to expect anything. I'm not going to demand anything. So she's not demanding, expecting anything. The daughter-in-law one day or whenever She's doing things, she goes and gives her tea or makes, cooks breakfast for her. She, she's not demanding it, what will she do? What will, what will her, her response or attitude be towards that breakfast that was cooked for her? Appreciate it, she will be thankful. No, 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 like, you know, like right now you can't do some breakfast for me. I, I don't expect you to you know, go and get me something right now. If you come, I say, just come back. Somebody brought me two mortars, I wasn't expecting it, so I was like, thank you, Jazakallah, like, wait, there was no need. So she'll appreciate it, and she'll be thankful. Every time the daughter-in-law is doing something, she says, thank you. 
Now when she thanks, appreciates and thanks her, shows gratitude and shukar, what will the result of that be? <coughs> Sisters know the answer to this better. What will the results of that be? No, not just dua. If someone appreciates... Do better next time. Yeah, the brothers give me answers for them. You'll do more next time. Come on, sisters, you know that. You just need to butter you a bit. With sisters, the more you... You know, if you want good food from your wife, just, just praise her food and you'll always get good food. You have to be a diplomat. You just say, you know what, that specific dish, butter chicken that you make, there's no way in the world, you know, even restaurants can't make you that. Sugar is all puffed up, puffed up. She'll make the next, you know, she'll make you that butter chicken. If you want some food, just do that. It's a good quality of women, actually. That, you know, if you, if you appreciate, then they want to do more. So now, if that mother-in-law is appreciating and thanking, she, the daughter-in-law, will, in next day, she, rather than waking up at 6.30 for breakfast, she'll wake up at 6 o'clock. And give more in return. Now, what's happened? Look, look at this scenario. What's actually happened? What's happened? In both cases, she is looking after her mother-in-law, the family. But in the first scenario, it's... In a, in a distasteful way. The mother-in-law is sad, upset, angry, why do you do it? And then she doesn't like it, why is she getting angry at me? Even if she does it, she's got a face on, like I have to do it. And like, doing something without your heart. In the second scenario, she's doing and actually doing more, but it's, she's saying, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. Jazakallah, no, no, no. And she's saying, no, 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 I will do it, I will do it. So it's being done again, but it's done with love, with wanting to do it. So this is the approach of Islam. And even if she doesn't do it, then it's not a requirement from a Sharia point of view. That there's no requirement. And that's why I said here as well that it is, many scholars have said that it's better to live separately. If the wife wants to live separately, then you have to live separately. That's the basic right of the wife. And some said even if the wife says, no, I don't mind, it's still better in this day and age. Causes less conflict. One of the scholars of the subcontinent, Hakim al Umar al-Sheikh Mawlana Ashraf Ali Tanwi rahimahullah, in his time, in the 60s and 50s, he used to, he's written his books, he says, according to me, I think, as soon as your son gets married, separate house, as soon as they do. That doesn't mean they need to go to Jupiter to live. And one son goes to the Mars, because some people say, oh, then who's going to look after my parents? Well, I, I said, are you going to Jupiter? That you will never come back from space. Live next door, live across the road, live, live, you know, somewhere else. Just live close by, you can live next door if you want. Visit your parents every day. If you've got elderly parents, cook at your home and go and give the food. Rather than cooking together in their kitchen, because then that's going to be problems. Two women in the same kitchen, problem. So cook at your house, ready-made food here, if you want to. But sharing the same house sometimes can cause problems. Sometimes it, it can work. I'm not saying it's definitely that's what you should do. It depends on each family. Some families can live together, fine. But if the wife wants to live separate, then it is the responsibility of the husband. He has to give her separate lodging. And separate means like anywhere close by as well is enough sufficient. So this is... Uh, a basic rule. Um, this will go a long way in preserving the marriage. Number seven, many marriages break down due to bad character and misuse of the tongue. We covered this yesterday, so I'm not going to go into this because you know what I talked about? Taqwa, Tazkiyah, so that's connected to this. Until both spouses do not have the fear of Allah in their hearts and accountability of the hereafter, it is difficult to fulfill each other's rights. Yesterday, remember, I explained this in a lot of detail. Number eight, love of dunya. Obsession with wealth, money issues, comparing marriages are all ingredients of marital conflict. Again, I've covered this. When we talked about Dazkia, remember, reforming the heart, went through each separate spiritual disease and how it affects the marriage. So we don't need to go into that. Money issues, comparing marriages, all of these things. 
A marriage based look at this look at this line. This line is important. A marriage based on money can never be prosperous. And honestly, this is and through experience, like with so many situations of so many people's marriage problems. Any marriage, the basis of which is wealth and money, will never be prosperous. Look, money and wealth is important in marriage, like in any aspect of our life, but it's not what a marriage should be based upon. If the foundation is all on money, then it's going to be problems. Money comes and goes. Al malu ghadin wa raih. One day you're rich, one day you're not rich. There's, there's, I know people, couples who divorce because there's one I know situation where the man was rich and he lost overnight money, something happened, and the next day the wife said, Give me a divorce. Like, there's no problems in the marriage. It's like crazy. Two, three children. He was like very rich, and suddenly some, I don't know what happened, this was a few years ago. I don't know the details because uh, too much. But overnight, for some reason or something, he lost all his wealth. Something happened to his business or something. And the next day, this Muslim woman wants a divorce. I just couldn't understand that. Like, you want a divorce next day. So until now, were you a wife or were you a... I won't say what. Until now, were you a wife or were you a... You know what I mean. When someone marries just for money, that's what they are basically. But in a dignified way. Some people do it on the streets in a non-dignified way. Some people just... If money is the actual issue, why are you getting married for? Money is okay. It is considered. The hadith says, So mal can be considered. It doesn't mean that you don't look at wealth at all. Of course you want a bit of stability in your life. So that's fine. One of the things to consider. But what I mean here is that a marriage which is completely based on wealth and money, there's nothing else, only money that we look at, then that marriage can never be prosperous. Number nine, and I already touched upon this yesterday and I said I'll talk about this in more in detail tomorrow, but I don't know if I want to go into this too much today, because today is a different day. Porn addiction. I gave some examples yesterday. I think they should be sufficient. I think you guys are too pure in your heart to know all the details of um, this filth, basically. So it's best sometimes not to even mention it. We talked about this yesterday. I told you there's a, there was a book, remember I mentioned Pornified, which is worthwhile reading for more details, how it affects marriages. But just a couple of minutes. Porn addiction and sins such as fornication, free and casual intermingling with opposite gender, glancing at unlawful things, dressing inappropriately will all have a negative impact on one's marriage. So many marriages end up because people have affairs with other people. That's another common thing. It's very, I mean, outside wider community is very common. Because people are living in a mixed world and they're dressing inappropriately and they are flirting with another. At the workplace, that's what happens. That's what, what is it now? November, right? That's what, what's going to happen in December. How many people will be ending up doing zina, married people? I'm talking about non-Muslims in the wider community. And that's what happens in December. December is the month of zina for them. I'm sure you guys know what happens. Christmas parties are whatever they are. Loads of things happen. They get drunk and then just... Because people are dressed inappropriately and... Now we're saying that's what happens to them. But do you know, even in the Muslim community, I don't want to depress you, but I hear, I, because I know a lot of things, seriously, there's a lot of things that happen in the Muslim community as well. Unlawful connections, relationships, whether you're married or not married, whether you're a man, you're a woman, you've got children, no children, it's cool, everything goes on. So-called practicing or not practicing as well. It's the weakest instinct of the human. 
Shaytan, Iblis, yeah, that's his name. That's the thing that he attacks the most. He might not be able to attack you from making you miss salah. He might not be able to attack you from some other angle, but this is the way he will attack you. It's a very, 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 very difficult situation to be in. So, therefore, when you're married, not even when you're married, even before marriage, but especially when you're married, just protect, protect, protect yourself. Have barriers, like around you, wherever you go. Oh, you who believe, don't even get close to zina. Allah didn't say, Oh, you who believe, don't commit zina. Don't even get close to zina. If zina is down there, then just like stay like here, really far. Like 100 meters away from it, or many meters away from it. Anything that could lead to zina, avoid. Anything that could lead to zina. Everyone knows their own situation, what could lead to. Like sometimes, you know, people ask, is this halal, is, it har- is this permissible in Islam, is this not permissible? I tell you one thing here. I actually delivered a course uh, recently. Um, it was actually just a course specially for sisters. It was an online thing, there's this online organization that organizes a lot of courses. So they've been doing courses with different teachers. Um, it's all about... Uh, for women, you know, I don't know, something like that, the title. But anyway, my session was um, rules of interaction and hijab and all of that. Like, I spent two hours going through a lot of detail of the rules of khalwa, hijab, dressing, niqab, uh, intermingling, all sorts of things. You know, people say, what about intermingling men and women sitting in a room together? With or without a barrier. I personally have the opinion if it's just sitting, then without a barrier is allowed as well. Otherwise, you're never ever going to fly to the UK. There's intermingling takes place in the plane. Like, intermingling is not how close you are. How many meters like you have to be away from a woman? That's not intermingling. Otherwise, you can never sit in a plane. Because you're sitting here, sometimes right next to you. A woman sitting on that seat... And you're sitting here, that's not intermingling. Sitting close to one another is not considered to be ikhtilat. That's my opinion. Barrier is good, so that it helps. Alhamdulillah, it's good. But that's not intermingling. Intermingling is free, casual, flirtatious conversation. What happens in some weddings? Dressed inappropriately, joking around, messing around, flirting, making some wings. Exchanging phone numbers. This is what we call ikhtilat. So, all of this has to really be avoided. Especially marriages. Marriages break down because of this. And I was, I didn't talk too much about the porn addiction, but I mentioned that yesterday. I remember I gave an example that, uh, yeah, just to, uh, this last point, and then we'll end. Just five more minutes, inshallah. Remember I mentioned this, I'm sure everybody was here yesterday, who was here, but I talked about porn yesterday in quite a bit of detail, that there's people who actually, once, this is an addiction, once people get an addiction, remember yesterday I was saying that even now it's becoming common in some women, but it's more of a man problem, addiction to porn is a major, major disease that sticks with you until you are 89 years old and 5 months. It's just a random number, yeah? Mm. Doesn't mean that 89 and 6 months it doesn't stay with you. All your life, it's an addiction. Seriously, you people who start watching porn from a teenage years, it will stick with them until they are Buddha, as they say, old man. It's an addiction, crazy addiction that destroys your life, marriage, everything. We need to talk about this. There should be Jumu'ah khutbas on this. You can't brush things under the carpet. People's lives have been destroyed by this. Imams and ulama and shuyukh and people, they should be talking about this openly. I feel like writing a whole separate book just on porn. A separate book on it. 
I was going to add a, as a chapter in my whole book, Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations, but I think I might just do a separate book. This, it's really bad. It's really, really bad. You know, some people ask, I know, there's no children here, right? People ask, okay, let's, let's leave it. But anyway, uh, you get the point. It's, it's, it's really, it's not a, it's, it destroys marriages. There's one thing I'll just mention here. It creates psychological impot impotence. Just one point, and that's it. You know what impotence is? Especially in men, impotence, that they're not able to fulfill the rights, intimate sexual rights of their wife. One is a physical type of, medical type of impotence. That's not your fault, it happens, it could happen, you need to go and get some remedies and halaj and treatment, whatever. But there's one psychological one, which means there's no, nothing physically wrong, but it's psychological, and that is created by porn addiction. Because what porn addiction does is that it makes a man unresponsive in a non-porn way to intimacy. So if, what that means that, for example, there's a specific style or scenario or kick that he gets in porn, if he does not get that, he won't get that with his wife, of course. Remember I gave an example yesterday, the man was sleeping next to his wife and she went to sleep and then she caught him halfway through. Do you remember I mentioned that he was watching online? Why? Because his wife, how the porn stimulates. And this is what happens with porn, they get bored with one aspect of porn. Then that stimulates them for like five, six months. After that, they get no excitement from that. They have to go to stage two, they have to go to stage three, they have to go to stage four. Different, different aspects of it. And some crazy, weird things. And people who go in there, they go to craziness, absolute craziness, like with animals and stuff like that. This, it's crazy, the whole industry. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry destroying the lives of human beings. All of them should be banned. There should be laws to ban all of them. But nobody bans them. Because all the money, the people at the top get all the money as well. Massive industry. Protect yourselves, protect your children. And now it's really easy, really easy. Do not give this to your children, please, brothers and sisters. You don't, in the olden times, it was difficult. Now, you don't need to go anywhere far to get experienced or exposed to porn. It's very easy, very easy. Before, even online, you had to go somewhere. Now it's on YouTube probably. I don't know, but I'm for sure. But I'm sure it's there, like, they could just search in Google and it comes up. Or anything like, it's just, Young, young children got a phone. They just have to put like, you know, girl, S-E-X in Google. And it's come up. And they, and young children, eight, nine, ten years old, they are very what? Um, so what? Yeah, no, but curious. Yeah, curious. I've experienced even my, my son's ten years old. Never give him a phone. Once by mistake, like for two, three days, uh, he was using his mom's phone, but he's taking his, you know, his room, bedroom, just trying, you know. And he typed out once, girl, Google, I checked it. Because I checked his search, everything. And then that's it, after that, you know, I took measures that, that never, ever, 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 ever happens. He searched it, and then the pages came up, and some of them were nude, like girls. Those are the pictures that came up. He's 10 years old, he's just curious. No problem. I told him afterwards, I had a discussion with him. I said, look, I, well, I was happy inside. At least he typed a girl, not a boy. <laughs> I thanked Allah for that, at least. And then I told him, look, you're a boy, girl. Like, what do you want to see? Why? Like, well, when you get old, you'll get a girl. I'll, give you, I'll find you a nice girl, don't worry. Then you can live with a girl all the time. Right now, just study. But you have to like talk about these issues with your children. But anyway, the of children is another topic. And lastly, just quickly, number 10. Tenth reason 
Look, all the others before this, if you look at it, point one to point nine are all things that break down marriages that we can do something about. The last thing is something we can't do anything about. That's incompatibility. You are a good Muslim, practicing, you've taken all the measures, there's no love of dunya, there's no expectations uh, from in-laws or from outside interference, there's no immature attitude, you know, there's no high expectations, gender roles are not mixed up, men are from Mars, you understood that, and women are from you know, Venus and difference. All of this is fine, yet sometimes there's something beyond your control that will break down in marriages, which is incompatibility. Now this, we should try to before getting married, you should try to see if there's compatibility. But you can't be sure. Sometimes you tried your best and still you entered a marriage, you thought you were compatible. Once you got married, you found, once you start living with them, you found there's no, there's no chemistry, there's no connection, there's no compatibility. Here, you could be the Imam Ghazali of the time and Rabi al Basri of the time and it's still, that's it. It's, you're just two different people. You're good human beings, you're good Muslims, you're practicing all of Islam. It's just that you are not there, you're not right for one another. So when there's no compatibility, then it's going to cause problems. And this is when Islam says, go divorce. It's just not going to work out. So therefore, uh, there's no compatibility between the spouses, which could lead to marriage breakdown. As such, it is important to make a well-informed choice from before. But even if you do, and then after you get married, you realize that there's no compatibility, then you can't really do anything about that. You, you, well, either you can live in that marriage and do sabr, so don't expect anything, just, just do sabr, inshallah. I want to just live in this marriage and just do sabr and patience and innama yuwafu sabiruna ajaruhum bi ghayri hisab or Islam says go for a divorce divorce is not haram and that's why next point is straight after break we're going to quickly look at this divorce and separation uh, subhanallah time is and we need, we need to take questions as well but I will do this for 20-25 minutes straight after the break inshallah let's take just a very quick like 10 minute break